Coming up on Network Africa. At least 50 people killed uh, in the Oromia region of Ethiopia. Angola's biggest opposition party, UNITA, files a legal challenge against the results of last week's election. Plus, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa and U.S. counterpart Joe Biden to hold talks at the White House. Hello and welcome to the program today, the last edition for the week. I'm Layo Olarinde. We begin in Ethiopia where residents in the western region of the country say they are living in fear following attacks where at least 50 people appear to have been killed in an area in Oromia region. Local residents say security forces had recently left the area and are blaming members of the Fano militia group for the violence earlier in the week. Houses are said to have been set on fire and properties looted during the attacks. While a brutal civil war in the country's north recently restarted after a five-month truce, Western Ethiopia has continued to see frequent violent attacks. Other parts of the country have also continued to face recurring violence. South Africa's President Sir Ramaphosa and the U.S. President Joe Biden will be holding bilateral talks on the 16th of September on a number of issues, including trade and energy. Well, this is according to a statement released by the White House. The leaders, building on their productive call back in April and the U.S.-South Africa strategic dialogue in August, they're expected to discuss more opportunities to deepen cooperation on investment, infrastructure, climate and health. The statement adds that the presidents would also reaffirm the partnerships between their two countries and discuss work together to address regional and global challenges. In South Africa, violence has flared up outside Califong Tashiri Hospital in Atridville, Pretoria, between members of anti-illegal immigration group Operation Dudula and the Economic Freedom Fighters. Dudula, which had been picketing outside the hospital for over three weeks, preventing foreign nationals from using the hospital despite a court interdict by the Gauteng Department of Health. Well, the health minister came visiting as the chaos went on and Channel's television was there to cover. The Kalafong Academic Hospital near Pretoria witnessed all forms of chaos again on Thursday despite a court interdict with the economic freedom fighters fighting with Operation Dudula, literally, and the police and the people sometimes caught in the middle. We found you know, many, many foreign nationals flooding our health healthcare systems, you know. And now the problem is our budget is constrained, you know. And then there are syndicates and syndicates who are coming to various hospitals and take treatments, and then they, you know, take it out of the country. We, we, we feel that the, the health minister has failed the people, particularly immigrants who are economic immigrants and Islam seekers who are here in South Africa. Uh, 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 by a uh, house of women can we be to treat our own people like this when we deny them access to health care and this has been happening for more than three weeks and they've never done anything south africa's health minister dr joe patler eventually came for an on-site visit to diffuse the tension we do accept the fact that our services are under pressure and that uh, uh, if this demand for services from across our neighbors keeps on increasing it, it will reach a stage where it is not sustainable. But we believe that it is not up to ordinary citizens of the country to think that they can deal with that uh, to, to help the state. No, that is not the correct approach. There are many other challenges which we must deal with to improve the quality of service. We acknowledge that even without even the pressure of other uh, neighbors, ourselves, we do have challenges. 
tough economic conditions, budget cuts and constraints, and rising anti-foreigner sentiments owing to a seemingly high number of undocumented foreign nationals in the country have seen even public office holders vent their frustration in public. And then how do you find yourself in Vila Vila <laughs> when you are supposed to be with Mundangago? You know he doesn't give me money to operate you guys. And I'm operating with my limited budget. They must thank the lucky stars I was not the leader of the country. Because I would walk in that hospital. I will unplug that gas that they are enjoying from South Africa. And I will bring somebody from South Africa. And I will connect them to the gas. So that this gas must be going to South Africans. If they must die, they must die. These utterances have, of course, sparked national debate on how right or wrong the officers are. But as the debate rages on, what's lost is that some foreign nationals are actually paying patients. Andrew is a Zimbabwean technician who just got out of a public hospital after surgery. He told us how much he feared for his life while in hospital. The problem that uh, getting the hospital, it was the challenge of the, the food. They would say they don't give me the food because of I'm a foreigner. I said, okay, it's fine. When they bring the food, I said, I'm full. When I bring the food, I said, I'm full. Why were you rejecting the food? But you were paying. No, was if someone say I'm a foreigner, mm. I don't know what they think that they are putting the food. So I have to, I don't want to eat the food because I don't know what they think that they put in the in the in the food. So until the the manager or the supervisor she came, she asked me why you are not eating. I said no. She said I'm a foreigner. So now I'm scared of my life. Acts of lawlessness, intimidation, and humiliation directed at foreign nationals, whether they are documented or undocumented, should not be tolerated. President Cyril Ramaphosa condemned any form of intimidation of foreign nationals at health facilities, documented or not. But government says, apart from internal efforts to tackle all factors contributing to the challenges, talks are also being considered on ways to reduce pressure on the health sector in collaboration with various home governments of the foreign nationals who use the facilities, not just financially, but also language assistance in some cases. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. In the meantime, South Africa's cabinet has approved a new design for coins that will feature inscriptions in all official languages. The official languages uh, are to be rotated annually over the next 10 years. Well, this is the fourth time South Africa will be changing the design of its coins, the last one being in 1989. The cabinet in a statement explained how the new design will look like for each denomination and the coins will be circulating from next year, although no sample design has been generated yet. Africans and the Caribbeans must consciously begin to break down barriers, perceived or real, hampering business relationship between both regions. Well, this was part of the submissions by speakers at the inaugural edition of the Afrexim Bank uh, sponsored Africa. Africa Rebeen Trade and Investment Forum taking place in Barbados. Our correspondent Chris Elems reports. Welcome to the Lord Erskine Sandyford Center in Bridgetown, Barbados, where the inaugural edition of the Africa Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum 2022 is holding with the theme One People, One Destiny, Uniting and Reimagining Our Future. Delegates from over 90 countries of the world, with 50 from the African continent, arrived to be part of the event. The country president arrives as scheduled for the commencement of the program. Nigeria's poet, Diki Chukumerije, sets the tone for the session. To an extent, to reincarnate here in the Caribbean as Calypso. The need to deepen partnership, strengthen strategic and business relationship, build linkages between the two regions, top the day's discussion. 
We are living in a period of global economic uncertainty and geopolitical upheaval. The result is that peoples of the South, including Africa and the Caribbean, are often caught in the middle with real life negative consequences. Consider that in 2018, total CARICOM exports to the rest of the world amounted to 18.6 billion US, with total exports to Africa of only 815 million US. CARICOM exports to Africa represented, therefore, 4.4% of its exports totally. In that same year, CARICOM imports from the world stood at 33 billion US with imports from Africa of only 603 million US. In his submission, the President and Chairman, Board of Africa and Bank, Professor Benedict Orama says, both regions must forge a common front to harness several opportunities available, including the $27 trillion North American markets. We who want to live here with actionable proposals on how to open air and sea links between the Caribbean and Africa. To share knowledge and jointly invest in climate adaptation projects and to create institutional arrangements that will enable capacity building and greater daily engagements amongst ourselves, including more Africa-Caribbean marriages so that the links we are rebuilding will be unbreakable. While history may have been unkind to the people of both regions with tales of slavery written in blood, the future awaits to be penned down in gold with the right course of action taken. We, the children of independence, have determined that we shall not allow another generation to pass without bringing together that which should never have been torn asunder. It's just the one of the conference and it's been fireworks from the beginning. Questions have been asked, graphs have been ported, compass has been designed that would help the continent or both region explore the vast, the huge resources available to them. From Bridgetown in Barbados, Chris Lems, Channels Television News. In Kenya, Raila Odinga's lawyers have argued his petition opposing the results at the Supreme Court in the capital, Nairobi, where they showed video clips alleging that results forms were changed to favor President-elect William Ruto. But these claims have been denied by lawyers for the Electoral Commission and those of Mr. Ruto. The seven Supreme Court judges are ending their hearings today and they would write a judgment which will be delivered next week on Monday. Mr. Odinga's official Twitter account shared a photo of the veteran politician following the court proceedings on TV. Meanwhile, Angola's biggest opposition party, UNITA, says it has filed a legal challenge against the results of last week's election. The governing MPLA party, which has been in power since 1975, was declared the winner of the vote, although with a reduced majority. A senior UNITA official, Faustino Mumbika, says that a complaint has been filed with the National Electoral Commission. UNITA, which achieved its best ever election results, has said... The polls were marred by irregularities. Still ahead on the program. Our Africa Tech segment discusses the benefits of training children in science, technology, engineering and math skills. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Sierra Leone's electoral body is set to begin a new voter registration exercise this weekend where all eligible voters are required to register again or people are required to produce their national identity cards to register as voters. According to the Electoral Commission of Sierra Leone, phase one of the exercise will run up to the 17th of September while a second phase expected to begin on the 20th would run up until the 4th of October. Over 3,500 centers have been mapped for the exercise across the country. 
President Julius Madabio has urged Sierra Leoneans, uh, the citizens aged 18 years and above, to come out and register to vote. The country is set to hold its general elections in June next year. <laughs> Welcome to our Africa Tech segment in River State, Nigeria. Children are being taught to gain mastery in coding, animation and others to be able to take advantage of the consistent shifts in a thriving technological ecosystem. They converge on the River's ICT Centre in Port Harcourt, the state capital, to demonstrate their newfound information and technological skills as the state government assures them of more support. It's a beehive of activity at the River's ICT Center as children take part in the Holiday Tech program. Mind the Gap, as it is called, features children between the ages of 9 and 16 who are taught animation, coding, photography, cinematography and robotics. They get to make presentations to their proud parents as an official of the state government expresses satisfaction with the exercise and assures that the government will create more awareness for next session. What we're going to do as a ministry is to create more awareness to, other, to parents because this is the median edition of this and they, you see that there is, there is a need of awareness so that you go to all Prince and Connor or River State. Some parents express their excitement with the progress their children are making in the digital space as a convener says the children are being equipped with the requisite skills to fill the tech gap in future. I hope that the Harbour Road team who put together this program will continue literally probably every holiday and just have our children learn robotics, graphics design, or whatever else they have to offer because the children of today, they are the future of our nation and they are the future of our lives as parents. Mind the Gap program has been a good program for them. It has taught them a lot of techs in the ICT world and they are practically perfect in all they did here. The teachers are wonderful and the program organizers they are very wonderful. For gaining new ICT vantage skills, the children can't hide their excitement. This program, Mind the Gap, has been a wonderful experience to me personally. Honestly, throughout these past three weeks, I've learned a whole lot of things. Not only the programs we came here for, like, like robotics, animation, photography and remaining. I also learned more things like teamwork, how to work together with your teammates. The three courses that I learned in this Mind the Gap program is photography, animation and robotics. All of them are very nice courses. Other highlights of the program also include demonstration by the kids and presentation of awards to the best students in different categories. Well, joining us now is Kenneth Mwokoro, the convener of Mind the Gap and also a development economist. Thank you for joining us on Africa Tech. Thank you. All right, let's just uh, dive into it. I believe you heard, you know, the children in that report, the excitement in their voices, you know, to be exposed to this kind of uh, thing. But tell us, what are the benefits of doing this, you know, at an early stage to children, exposing them to technology? Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, we know that children are the future, and of course, um, tech also is the future, so we need to expose them as early as possible um, so they get to build the, the necessary skill sets that they require and to be relevant in the future, um, as well as being relevant in today's world. Um, so it's important that children are exposed to this sort of things, um, so they, they, they know because obviously the scenario we have today will obviously change. I mean, it's not what we have today. I mean, scenario we had 10 years ago is not what we have today. And what we have in 10 years to come, that is the next decade, not the scenario we have today. So we need to equip this to our children, you know, because they are the future. 
They need to learn tech skills. They need to understand how things work. It's sort of things that will that will be available in the future, that's in the next decade. And the sort of things that they need to begin to position themselves to to be in take advantage and, and be, you know, in position to um to 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 utilize all of these things that comes their way at that time. So it is very, very important. It's, it's a benefit for, for children um, at, this, at this point in time that they get exposed to to um, to tech and all of the things that it talks that it pertains to. Well, it's not Can you there's hear me? the yeah, there's no new, it's not news rather that, uh, you know, there are great opportunities that technology can provide to children. But investment in STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering and maths and other related areas is very, very important. How do you think we fared in Nigeria uh, uh, with regards to that? Um Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. It's a very good question. Um, but the point to be made here is I don't think we've really fared well. Um, I mean, there hasn't been so much investment you know, made in STEM education. Um, obviously, um, we, 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 get, we get to see that children, you know, over the time, uh, over the years, they get to improve themselves. I mean, recently I was just talking to someone, a proud parent whose daughter, you know, came out as the Af African ambassador for maths. In here, in in River State, at the um, at the at the at the secondary school in River State, so it's very very important that these things are done. I mean, there's no gain saying that investment needs to be put in place for STEM education, um, but at the same time, I think one of the things myself as a futurist and entrepreneurial coach can talk about is, in the, when, when when we're in making investments in STEM, we should also try and infuse entrepreneurial development and future thinking into the whole conversation because if we have children who are STEM, you know, um, developed and those sort of things without knowledge of what is going to happen in the future, without understanding what future, the future, I mean, what the future holds for them, it makes a nonsense of it. Because at the end of the day, they'll just be children that have been trained in basic science, technology, um, um, engineering, and maths, you know, as it were. So it, it, it's, it's also important that we begin to infuse future thinking into it. So it's not just not just making investment in STEM education and those sort of things. Um, because there, there are certain signals that shows that education will not be what it is today in the future. There are a number of signals, I mean, sort of argumented and virtual reality and those sort of things that gives a pointer to what education learning processes will look like in the future. Mm -hmm. So we need to be conscious about that and begin to make investments, not just in STEM related areas, but to consciously get the children to begin to think about the future. In our, in our, in our Mind the Gap uh, holiday tech program, we asked the ages of 13 to 16 to go to 2032 and bring what we call the artifacts of the future to the present. So they went there using signals and trends, which are basic concepts of future thinking. And I'm sure parents were wild, you know, when they're making their presentations on that day. So they, they're able to tell us what education will look like in 2032, what transportation will look like in 2032, and what health will look like in 2032. So this, that, that's that's an that's an add-on to STEM courses. You know, that, that's that, that's 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 that, that, that's my take on that. Uh, and talking about uh, the parents, you know, some might be, do, do not really think, you know, they should expose their children to technology uh, for their own numerous reasons. But I believe from this uh, discussion so far, <laughs> they would have been able to, you know, change their minds. But thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kenneth yes. Umokoro, uh, the convener of Mind the Gap and also development economist and futurist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that's it on the program for today and for the week. Thank you so much for always being a part of it. I'm Layo Olaridi. Have a great weekend.